Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers, if you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Superconnectivity Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Cherubic Charlie Esser. And with me today is... Powerful Phil Parrish. Very powerful, Phil. <laughs> so today we're discussing the aftermath of the Avengers vs. Uh, X-Men Axis series. And specifically the two uh, uh, new heroes whose series is premiered this week. Uh, the Superior Iron Man. And the all-new Captain America. Uh, so I know you've read the uh, Superior Iron Man. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I really liked it. I can't wait for the next part. Uh, because, I mean, now Tony Stark's completely unpredictable. And we get some really cool new armor. Um, what is it? It has some element of a symbiote in it. Yes, it's the living metal armor, which, you know... As Pepper Potts says, that that can't possibly go wrong. Uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, of course, what we're getting here is in the uh, Superior Spider-Man vein, um, a villainous mind in a superheroic body. Though in this case, it's Stark's own uh, villainous mind, which is an interesting take on the theme. Um, now, uh, my my actual. Uh, in full disclosure, which is going to shock uh, many people out there, I actually did not really follow the uh, Avengers vs. Uh, X-Men Axis storyline. Um, uh, so I actually didn't... I was completely blindsided when I read these books and found out that, oh, wow, there was uh, a personality switch here. Um, but what drew me to Superior Iron Man was uh, the superior branding of the um uh that because i was a huge fan of the superior spider-man storyline with dr octopus trying to be good uh what's interesting in this is that of course it's not tony stark trying to be good uh it's tony stark just actively just being uh <laughs> evil tony stark oh. you know um which is which is a, a very interesting take on the character um what did you now? Um, of course, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, there will be spoilers. Um, uh, the 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 reveal at the end, the gentleman that Pepper Potts was talking to. Um, what did you think that was? Uh, I don't know. Is it someone wearing the armor? Is it some kind of uh, AI, like a Jarvis or something? Mm -hmm. uh, or the, I even had a wild thought. What if uh, some point down like in the past before uh, Stark got uh, inverted all evil could that be a copy of Stark's brain in this suit well that's actually something I'm thinking of um, if you remember uh, during the um, Dark Reign storyline uh, mm -hmm. Tony Stark uh, had basically downloaded all of the information from the from the shield mainframe um, regarding uh, superhero identities into his own brain and then mm. opted to erase it. And, of course, the way we got Tony Stark back was he did make a previous uh, backup copy of himself. And so I'm, I'm thinking that what we're, what we're looking at there was a... Essentially, essentially which, which could play in very interestingly into the upcoming Avengers Age of Ultron film, is a um, cybernetic... Tony Stark, Tony Stark's mind, but running on uh, an, an intelligent computer. Um, and, of course, there is precedence for this in the MCU, uh, specifically in the MC2 universe, 
and the next uh, storyline, which was the uh, Avengers group in that universe, there was a character, I believe his name was Mainframe, who everyone thought was just a guy like James Rhodes in an Iron Man armor, and it was later revealed that no, actually, it's just a com- computer program designed to run on a series of armors for um, for uh, Tony Stark. So and plus, and plus, didn't that wasn't the mainframe armor? Didn't it have a similar look to the armor Tony Stark was using before this last one? The uh, that absolutely. like black armor. Uh, yes, actually, and that was one of the things that made me think of mainframe was seeing that first uh, uh, scene there with um, Teen Abomination and um, and uh, uh, She Hulk and Iron Man and um, saying, "Hey, you know that looks a lot like the mainframe armor from the MC 2 and then of course it's revealed that it actually is just an empty armor, which which was a great scene, I think, you know, with the head coming off and, and saying, "My, that was disorienting." Oh yeah. Yes. Um, now, here's an interesting point in this, because uh, which is going to go into, into into the Captain America storyline that I wanted to explore as well. Um, it's based in California. In this issue is both She-Hulk and Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Uh, over in the She-Hulk comic book right now, you also have She-Hulk and Daredevil in, uh, in California, because they're... Um, uh, handling the tr- the uh, trial of uh, Steve Rogers in that storyline, um, and which sort of implies that it's a contemporary story uh, going on with that court case. Um, but you know, this 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 leads to what I think is kind of a a complex issue with Marvel, which is uh, having sort of these multiple timelines inside their own stories. That do eventually sort of get revolve, resolved with a bit of hand waving them, but I, mm-hmm. I I find it somewhat disorienting. And and as a prime example of that, you have the all new Captain America series, uh, featuring Sam Wilson as Captain America and Ca- uh, Captain America and the Mighty Avengers. Now in the Sam in the all new Captain America series, uh, Sam Wilson is very much seems to be the Sam Wilson that we've uh, known and loved all these years. He um, is a decent uh, guy. He's looking to do well uh, as, as a superhero, as Cap's replacement, or uh, not even as replacement, but as the new Captain America. Um, and he's, you know, being noble, even even calling Ian, Ian who is the new nomad, on, on uh, killing a Hydra agent in trying to save Sam. Um, and then when we get to Captain America and the Mighty Avengers, we have, uh, this reveal that Captain America, Sam Wilson is very much, um, is actually crazy, if you will. He's, he's gone quite mad, um, with real shades of, uh, the William Burnside 1950s cap in there, I think, you know, uh, mm-hmm. he's very much, oh, criminals don't have rights and, you know, this is for the good of the world, and we see at the end of it him teaming up with um, with uh, um, Tony Stark, evil Tony Stark, in their plot to destroy the Avengers, specifically the Mighty Avengers. Uh, and notably within that, we also have it suggested, I think, that um, uh, Quantrell, uh, who is the villain of the of uh, a recent villain that we had in the Mighty Avengers, um, is. Uh, partnering with um, Luke Cage, although that's not directly presented. It seemed to be uh, definitely what they were implying there. Ah, so within that, w- w- within that, um, I find it very interesting because we're left asking, when are all of these things happening? Now, well, uh, one interesting thing, I think some of these are taking place maybe a few months at, fr- ahead of now because in the su- first page of Superior Iron Man, it was talking about how they were the personalities were inverted, mm-hmm. and then I think it said when as they when they were changed back, Stark evaded being tra- changed back. Well, in the uh, Axis miniseries, um, they haven't been changed back yet. Yes, yes, and and so it comes to this question of is um, but and but see, and that's my point that in the Captain All New Captain America, they have been changed. Uh, Sam Wilson isn't isn't the evil Sam Wilson that we can see, which yeah. raises the question: Is he 
does this take place before or after? And that's always this, this question that I've had. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, the aging of Captain America was something that was in the contemporary comics. At the same time, Original Sin was going on, although in Original, in original Sin, Cap was his old Cappy self. And so mm-hmm. we're left to assume that took place before um, Cap's de-aging. Now we have Cap uh, aged up, uh, because we know that Sam's there. So it gives us this kind of a gap. Was Is there this big gap that's going on uh, between when Sam Wilson takes over as Captain America and when Axis happens? So is the book, uh, the current Captain America book happening in the past, or is it happening post-Axis? And this is something I think Marvel really has... I don't want to say has a problem with, but it is something that they 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 have show up uh, a lot, um, where you're not quite sure during this story when things are happening, and then they resolve it at the end and sort of say, "Oh, now it's all contemporary." But you're kind of left saying um, that timeline doesn't really make sense. Yeah, well, I think when they do, you know, they either the do the miniseries events or even the regular monthly books, they do these. Uh... You know, you, you could get like a six to eight month or even longer uh, story arc, and by the time you're done with this arc, you know, the events in other books have already happened and changed certain characters. Yeah. Like the Captain America, you said, yeah. Yeah, and that, of course, you know, that's of course an issue that goes all the way back to the Secret Wars, when, you know, one issue, uh, all the characters leave the planet, and then the next issue, they're all back, and they're all changed from the Secret Wars, but they can't really go into that because they hadn't revealed what happened at the Secret Wars yet. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's it's a very old problem, but it's it can get kind of uh, frustrating for, for, the, for the reader, and especially when you're sort of reading more than one book at once, uh, and you can see that, well, there's this big time gap, and you're not quite sure where the gaps are, are being put in. We don't know um, which... Uh, we don't know which cap we're dealing with. In, in cap and the... Um, in the new Captain America, is this the evil Cap or is this um, the good Cap? And is it after he gets switched back or after he uh, or, or during his time as a? Um, oh, does, does this take place after or before? Is is the yeah. question? Um, now getting into the Cap question because this is actually something I'm surprised isn't a lot more controversial. Which is, of course, you have. You know, the new Captain America, Sam Wilson, and to have him immediately be tarnished in this way, it's 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 a little awkward, first off, because he's an African American and that's a plot line that they did explore when James Rhodes was um, Iron Man. Um, James Rhodes actually it was a plot line at the time that the original Iron Man armor had this glitch in its neural interface that was, that caused him to sort of become violent and 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 destructive. And it also implied that that it actually ha- was what um, drove uh, Tony Stark to alcohol alcoholism at the time. When um, w- was that this glitch in the neural interface was basically causing poor impulse control, I guess. And mm-hmm. now you have basically the same kind of storyline where oh. We're putting a black guy in the uniform, and now he's going to go. Now he's going to be violent, and it's going to kind of tarnish the image of the of the character, and and particularly with Sam Wilson because Sam Wilson's history has him being mentally manipulated by the Red Skull and betraying Captain America and all this kind of stuff where he, where um he was like originally like sort of in his original incarnation he was this guy who was essentially fabricated to be the perfect partner for Captain America. I believe Dr. Faust just sort of programmed him to be Captain America's perfect partner. And then uh, they sort of retconned that, retconned all that out. But now they seem to be sort of throwing it back in there. And, you know, the politics of comic books, they, they, they get really deep at times and really problematic when people, when, when people get upset about these things. Um, yeah. But I, I, I don't, I don't think that there's too much uh, stink about it because it's not just him. It's him. There's a bunch of Avengers. I know Medusa, the Inhumans, uh, the X-Men. Mm-hmm. They were all inverted, so it, it was, it's not like it was just him. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and that, of course, I, that, that is, is, is definitely a saving grace for it. And that could very well be why it's not uh, more controversial. But um, 
but for me, when I see that, I go, wow, that's that's this old James Rhodes storyline again. And it's also kind of just the old um, the Sam Wilson storyline. Um, you know, obviously, I'm sure the redemption is going to be that, you know, these heroes revert themselves or something like that. So they show they actually had the moral character to correct themselves. Although within that, within this whole concept, um, in the Mighty Avengers, there was a very great scene with um, uh, the Plunderer, who was also inverted. And uh, it was also suggested from this that the inversions, um, much like the hate wave, sort of got broadcast worldwide so that many people, who even people who weren't at Genosha at the time, were affected by the, um, by the inversion. And so he was inverted to be, now he wants to, he still wants to rob and steal and do that, but he wants to do it for the, for starving orphans, as he says. So, um, and of course, uh, this runs afoul of the all new Captain America in uh, Captain America and the Mighty Avengers, where, uh, he goes and basically beats up everyone. And Quantrell, who is clearly kind of seems to be aware of what's going on, at least, um, at least partially, you know, is quite fascinated by the fact that the new Captain America is quite violent and beating people up. <laughs> yeah, there was a scene in Axis where uh, he had a disagreement with Nick Fury, and he basically decked Nick Fury. Yeah, yes, it's 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 an interesting take. Um, now, within that concept, I do one. It makes me wonder if we might see William Burnside come into this again. Um, William Burnside, of course. Uh, was the 1950s Captain America had a uh, knockoff version of the Super Soldier Serum that sort of, um, and this was sort of this, this this idea was that if you if the serum wasn't quite right, it basically slowly drove you mad. And um, with uh, with him, what it did was it took his patriotism and sort of perverted it into this sort of McCarthy esque. Uh, paranoia and um, and we, we see a lot of shades of that in, in this and it makes me wonder uh, because the last time we saw William Burnside he had been hit by a truck uh, but of course with super soldier serum he's healing up and um, it leads us to wonder one could he have been inverted as well um, and two could he come in as, as a hero in this um, and that would be interesting and likewise within that you also have the possibility that we might see uh, other Captain Americas that could come and redeem the legacy there. You also have um, Isaiah Bradley, who was the African-American Captain America from World War II, uh, who last we saw was suffering from what seemed to be sort of a Parkinson's-like disease, but perhaps something in this could have corrected that as well, um, which might be a little... Easier to do than having the big, the white, the the blonde hair, blue eyed white guy punch Sam mm. back to uh, 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 cognizance instead of uh, if, if you had Isaiah Bradley be going to uh, knock some sense back into him. But, yeah, that yeah, that fifties cap. Um, I think it would be interesting if he came back and he wasn't inverted to see his reaction to the new Captain America, Sam Wilson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they of course ran very much afoul in um, in uh, in in his last uh, run out during the Winter Soldier years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he actually had captured um, Sam, was using the vibranium in his uh, his Falcon gear to create uh, a some sort of vibranium bomb that that the Watchdogs were going to be using to sort of commit a terrorist act, and so. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. And they, I think they toned down a lot of the racist aspects of, um, the fifties cap in, in that storyline, which of course in the original 60s storyline were, were very, very blatant that they wanted him. To oh yeah. Very a racist cap. Although, you know, it's funny. It's very funny. Um, at the same time that they were running this, they ran some kind of interesting stories. They ran a, a, a 1950s cap story that was sort of based in the fifties um, where he's, you know, you know, going out and finding these communist moles and, you know, kind of, and, and they do touch on his craziness, but they kind of make it seem like, well, yeah, but he's also fighting the good fight and being the hero here. 
but what was interesting is they also printed an actual 1950 story and I tell you, j- just that, just that 1950s comic book writing, he seemed kind of crazy in it, you know? <laughs> just, you know, in the way that he's dealing with these, uh, with, with, I think it was the yellow claw he was, uh, uh, chasing down at the time. And, uh, you're like, wow, he really is, uh, he really is a lunatic, isn't he? <laughs> is that the, um, was that the, uh, what did they call it in the 50s? It was a Captain America in the House of Horrors or something. Oh, uh, actually, I think it was... Was it Was it the... Well, there was, it was, there was Young Man's I, Adventures, and then there was um, Captain America. Uh, cause, yeah, because I think they touched on it in that Marvel special that... Uh, you know, in the fifties, superheroes were kind of out, and the you know the horror comics were selling well, so like they kind of, uh, yeah. what uh, to combine Captain America with like a horror comic or something? Yeah. Well, they did a lot of that with a lot of a lot of uh, characters where they uh, uh, eventually the heroes got less and less prominent in their own books, and um, you know, uh, but yes, actually, I think it was Tales of Suspense, if I'm not mistaken. If, if I'm remembering correctly, Captain America was part of Tales of Suspense. Which eventually, I believe, is where we first get our first glimpse of Iron Man, and the Marvel uh, heroic age re- re- uh, begins again uh, mm-hmm. after Captain America had retired from that. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it makes for an interesting question: um, exactly how far they're going to take the 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 inverted heroes. And it is interested seeing interesting seeing these inverted heroes. And of course, we also have the inverted villains. We have. Um, you know, Carnage now is a good guy, um, <laughs> who is still not right in the head, which is what is interesting about this, is Carnage is a good guy, is not suddenly Peter Parker. He's still um, sociopathic, lunatic Cassidy, but now he's beating up bad guys, which is, um, which I think might come into uh, a deeper question about heroism with uh, with superheroes here. Which is that if Stark winds up doing good, even though he's evil, um, you know. Well, and and we see this in the um, in the uh, in in that first Superior Spider-Man or uh, Superior Iron Man storyline, where yes, he he has created these the the extremist um, thing, <laughs> the, the app, yeah, for yeah, the, the the app for your body. Um, the app that gives you abs is, is I guess, how you would describe it uh, if you're in a pitch meeting. Um, and uh, and then, of course, and you know, it, it leads to people, you know, attacking those who didn't have Stark phones at the time. Um, and then, of course, he takes it away from them, uh, sort of balancing the scales again. Um, and it's well, a- he was. I don't know about balancing the scales, but he he said he told Pepper he says I I need to make mo- I am gonna make money, so he gave them a taste and he took it away for what was it like a hundred dollars for the next hit? Yeah, for day it's a it's a hundred dollars a day, which is a lot to spend for uh, <laughs> for that. Um, he's kind, he's kind he kind of, he's kind of like a drug dealer now. Well, exactly. Well, it's exactly what he is. He, yeah. There's um you know there was a. Similar story, uh, well, not a similar story, but you know, in um, at the very end of um, D- uh, Dark Rain and the end of the siege, there was a whole thing with the hood and the hood, you know, just needing to get powers back because after uh, he lost, after Bromamo had uh, had sort of severed ties with him, he had no powers and he couldn't handle the straight life of being just a normal hood again. He had to get his powers back and, you know, was willing to spend every last dollar he had to do it. Um, you know, so that's an interesting recurring theme, superpowers as a drug. Um, something interestingly enough, you actually uh, touch on with uh, characters like the Hulk has had that um, sort of storyline, um, maybe not so blatantly discussed, but, you know, guys like the Hulk, guys like the thing, guys who complain about their powers constantly when they do lose their powers, there have always been these stories where, well, now I must regain my powers to save the day because, you know, they're always a little mm-hmm. too 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 eager to go back to that life that ostensibly they say was the most horrible thing ever to be trapped in that monster's body. But, 
you know, as soon as it becomes available, oh, well, I guess I better go do that again. Better, better put the rocks back on so I can defeat Doctor Doom because it's not like there's any other superheroes in New York City. <laughs> the grass the grass is always greener on yeah. the other side. Well, you know, well, you know, I've always felt that that's actually sort of why the thing, you know, can't change back. This is uh this is uh, uh just just to get into a little side topic here. Um that you know the thing that you know when you're when you're a super when you're a person who goes through a physical metamorphosis when you change, there's always this separation of persona that you know, there's the Hulk and there's Banner. There's She-Hulk and then there's Jennifer Walters. And even though Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk are pretty similar, there are distinct character differentiations between She-Hulk and Jennifer. And with the Thing, because he's always the Thing, he doesn't have that separation of personality. But we've seen when he does get the ability to change, you start to see that separation of personality. And my my theory is that going back to the John Byrne statement that there was this mental block that kept him from changing, uh, specifically, as John Byrne put it, was that he didn't want to change because he was afraid Alicia wouldn't love him anymore if he was just a regular guy. Uh, I think, although that might have been an impetus for it, I think what it was was that he feared that if the Thing and and Benjamin Grimm were two different people, the Thing would become his own being, and he... and Benjamin Grimm would become less and less a thing and become less and less human, that he would become less human um, if he changed back and forth. And so he locks himself as the thing to maintain his humanity because he knows it's too much of a temptation if he loses his powers to try and get them back. Because once you've been a superhero, how could you ever go back? And at the same time, he doesn't want to lose himself. And so rather than become human and be weak or switch back and forth until the monster actually becomes a monster. He just chooses to remain a monster on the outside so that he can remain a man on the inside. Anyway, that's my, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was going to bring up the mental block thing, but then there's, there are, there have been stretches of years at a time where he hasn't been with Alicia and he still can't change back. Yeah. And one, and that would be, well, um, <clears throat> uh, as, 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 as this is, I'm a big Thing fan, so I, I read the whole um, Rocky Ben Grimm Space Ranger series uh, storyline when he was staying on uh, a battle, battle world, and um, and when he came back and hooked up with Vance Astrovic back when he was just a snot-nosed teen, teen with uh, limited telekinetic powers. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he's come a long way, that kid. Uh, and in the Guardians of the Galaxy as well thousand mm-hmm. years from now but that's that's a whole other uh bag of hammers um speaking of disparate timelines um but yeah uh so when he's on battle world he sort of confronts a ben Grimm, who in many ways sort of exemplifies all the worst aspects of ben Grimm. um and he defeats him in battle and kills him and then when he gets back to earth reed richard says look i have to tell you this you can change back to ben Grimm any time it was just this mental block, and he says, oh, well, I wish you would have told me that before, because I just killed Ben Grimm, and so I can never turn back again. So he had already created this sort of other, that clearly makes no sense psychologically, except that it, it gives him an excuse to not change back. Um, and, you know, this was actually, um, and I want to say this was in the, I want to say it was in Millar's run, that might have been, um, uh, because uh, just before, right now, when the thing can transform, uh, he had had the ability to transform back and forth after being exposed to something that Diablo had uh, whipped up that sort of froze him as a rock. And then when the rocks broke, he became Ben Grimm again, and then he could change back and forth. And they sort of created this concept that when he changes back into Ben Grimm, his rocks sort of shift into another dimension, and they get mad at him for not wanting to be the thing, and they spawned off into these evil monster homunculuses that attacked, you know, were trying to attack New York City. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about Fantastic Four. They really can go completely crazy at times in their stories. Like, just just completely, yeah, it's a whole pocket dimension inside the Baxter build. It's it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And oh yeah, in there there's all these homunculi things that are trying to rampage and destroy the world. And if we don't defeat them, they'll get out and destroy the world. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, now yeah. I th- 
I think now isn't didn't the kids of the future foundation create some kind of formula I think he took that he now he changes back to Ben Grimm once a like one day a year yes and that you see to me you see and this the, to me that whole one day a year is 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 proof of my theory but because to me what it is because read in, in the whole storyline they present they went over all of Reed's research which means they read all this stuff about the mental block mm-hmm. knew everything about the mental block and um you know, and of course, if these are smart kids, they say, well, if he has a mental block, maybe he still has a mental block. And they probably sort of, so maybe he just doesn't want to, maybe, you know, coming my, because, th- hey, I'm sure these are all smart kids. They're probably smarter than me. Figure out that, hey, you know how people who change have that dis- d- separation in their personalities? Maybe that's what he's afraid of. But maybe if mm-hmm. gave him an excuse and said, okay, it's just one day a year that you'll be human and then... You'll just go back, and it won't because you have to go back. It's just it's not because you're choosing to go back. It's just something that's going to happen. It puts him in this position where he accepts that and he gets that change. And so my my take is they're just giving him sugar water. That that's the secret formula is the sugar water. And they he drinks the he drinks the placebo, and, mm-hmm. and he goes, oh, I feel it changing me, and now I'm Ben Grimm again. And it's like, oh, and in 24 hours I'm just going to switch back. Um, which you know is is it just seems really likely to me, and and again uh, the, another reason why I think that is is because uh, they created a cure for thingism and no one thought to tell anyone like the she thing this that uh, you know you know uh, who is also who just showed up in um, in Marvel comics uh, in the Fantastic Four as well because she's in Rutgers Island because uh, yeah. she was trafficking um, mutant growth hormone. And it's like, gee, you have a cure for thingism. Maybe you should mention that to who? Uh, Carol, uh, not Carol Danvers. Um, uh, Sharon Ventura. Sharon Ventura. I always get those two mixed up for some reason. Well, because they're uh-huh. Ms. Marvel. Um, uh-huh. Sharon Ventura. Uh, maybe you should mention that to her. And uh, no one did. They forgot. Uh- yeah, but but if we go with our theory that it's a placebo for Ben Grimm, it might not necessarily work on her. Well, it wouldn't. And um, of course. You know, and that was the thing is that when she first turned into a thing, you had very much, uh, uh, and they built up this very strong idea of a mental block for her too. That she sort of became. Well, she didn't want to change back to normal. Yeah, she didn't want to change back to normal because she, when she was, and of course this changed later on, but when she, when she was Ms. Marvel, she was. Although of course, it's as as it always is in the comic books, it's left very vague exactly what happened, but she was. Mm-hmm. Tied up in Dr. Malice's lab. Uh, Dr. Carl Malice was, of course, the guy who was doing the superhuman augmentation for the power broker for the Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation. And uh, she was in some way, um, you know, uh, sexually attacked. Um, that left her very much afraid of, of that, which makes sense, you know, especially if you're a superhuman and you're used to feeling powerful and then you have that power taken away. I, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, you know, got to be a horrible thing. And so you can understand that. And, of course, then as a character, she just sort of got kicked around a lot, got abducted by scrolls, and no one came looking for her. And, you know, really, 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 I, I honestly feel bad for that character. I've actually been writing Marvel a lot um, all the mm-hmm. time for, say, hey, bring back uh, Sharon Ventura, bring back the she thing, bring back bring back the second Ms. Marvel so that, you know, because here's a character who everyone forgot about and she's cool and you got to bring her back because she is cool. And, um, you know, before becoming the thing, she was a world-class athlete and fighter. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, putting her in charge of the yard was, was, you know, they did it well because she still has her strength. But I thought it would have been cool if, hey, even without her strength, she actually still had, she was still in charge because, you know, she was this, you know, multi- she had multiple black belts before becoming the thing. You know, even as Miss Marvel, she was she was this superior athlete. Um, but anyway, but yeah, so that 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 is my theory on the thing. Just to get completely off of that, off of the original topic of access. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, but and but you know, superpowers and mental disorders seem to go hand in hand in the Marvel universe. Uh, yeah, I find that all fascinating. Like the the the. the, the, the especially when they do the physical transformation. Yeah. 
I love the Peter David uh, Gray Hulk run. Oh, that was fantastic. And and oh, now yeah. with uh, Doc Green, um, again, you have, and again, you always notice that, 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 that very specific physical changes to the Hulk always relate to some sort of a mental, mental uh, a projection of him where, you know, mm-hmm. no two Hulks are alike. And now, of course, he looks a lot like uh, Professor Hulk, who later became the maestro, or the ma- maestro, yeah, the maestro. Oh, sh- one of those words, you read it, you're not quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's spelled Mastero. He's the Mastero. No, it's the Mastero. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, and of course, uh, Maestro is coming back is part of this uh, upcoming um, revisiting of alternate uh, worlds and universes in the New Secret Wars, so... So isn't that neat that we have Professor Hulk, who's a, who again was a little bit evil even before this, even before the switch, we had uh, Professor Hulk is fairly evil. Um, I don't know if you read the Hulk though, but um, there's uh, mm-hmm. right now he's going around mm-hmm. trying to uh, de- depower, depower yeah. all the other Hulks, and um, they re- the last issue he depowered, um, he depowered well he depowered Rick Jones, who's a bomb. Just prior to this, and there, he's depower. He just depowered Betty Ross, and there was this pretty clear personality switch. I felt at the end, which you could argue, oh, that's because they are no longer being included by Gamma. But I actually think that he had programmed the nanobots to make them accept what he did to them. Just make them accept, mm-hmm. possibly because he knows if they were just left to their own devices, they would, of course, as Bruce Banner has done many times, go back to being the Hulk, trying to be the Hulk again because it's just too too great a thing to pass up to to be the Hulk. Um mm-hmm. you know that at least that's that's my theory. We'll see how it pans out. Um yes, so so yes. Yeah, so, so so that's that now of course and again along those lines what's interesting in that is that uh speaking of characters that get forgotten, um Marlo, Rick's girlfriend uh, didn't get a vowel made for her, and she's still the harpy. <laughs> <laughs> was another one of the characters that was came out of the World War Hulks, uh, well, not World War Hulks, but um, no, w- World War Hulk. Yes, it was World War Hulks uh, with the um, uh, Illumin, with, with not the Illuminati, but the the wizard and the leader and all these brilliant supervillains uh, attacking everyone, and uh, they oh, yeah, and Modok, and they created, they turned Marlo into the harpy who was originally the gamma form of uh, betty ross and when she was exposed to gamma radiation um but you know so 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 there are more gamma people out there than the hulk has created serums for and you know i guess not all of them are gonna get their own uh their own book for it <laughs> yeah well i don't yeah well i don't think he's done with everyone yet because i think they've even hinted, hinted that he is going to go after uh general ross the oh yeah hulk. yeah well that is the next person in fact um General Ross is going to come after him because he's not one to wait. Uh, <laughs> and that will be interesting. I really hope they don't depower uh, Red Hulk because um, I really like him as a character. Um, of course, I don't know how permanent any of these depowerings are going to be. The only one I really was kind of glad for was the depowering of Rick Jones because uh, I just didn't like him as A-bomb. And Seth Green doesn't do him any justice. <laughs> no? I have a small child loves Hulk and the agents of smash, but, uh, oh, yeah. yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah. Um, love Seth green, his a bomb, not necessarily my favorite, my favorite part of this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I watch it with my year and a half year old. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That's, it's a fun show. And then, yeah, I just see all those superhero characters. It, it amazes me how much Marvel is interacting with young kids. Um, I was uh, took my kids to the barber shop, and this little girl, because uh, they were reading, I forget what what comic book they had. What, but you know, I have all my kids have comic books, and they were brought in some comic books. And she was going in, and she said, "Oh, that's this, and that's that, and that's that." And it was like, you know, this little girl couldn't have been more than five or six, and and she had gotten it all from Superhero Squad. You know, she knew all these characters from Superhero Squad, and was just really into Marvel superheroes. So I was like, mm-hmm. "Yes, they're getting them young," and you know. <laughs> 
think that's the Disney influence there. Yes. Well, that's what happened before they made the merger with Disney. I think actually it was probably yeah. stuff like Superhero Squad that got Disney going, hey, you know, we should yeah, maybe. use of that. Yeah. Yeah, because now on that Disney channel, they have Hulk and the Agents of Smash. They have Avengers Assemble, Ultimate Spider-Man. Yes, but no more Superhero Squad. <laughs> they they got there. I think they had like three or four seasons, and then they, they called it quits, which which is frustrating because I really love the Superhero Squad because I, I really love – I like when, when they play with, with, with these genres for the adults. You know, It's like Teen Titans Go. I really love Teen Titans Go. And I like Teen Titans. Mm-hmm. Teen Titans cartoon until I was a, an adult, you know. So it's not like mm-hmm. it's my childhood being destroyed here. It's me as an adult mm-hmm. looking at the humor of the uh, of, of, of 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 the sort of kiddie show version of, uh, of 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 these heroes that I love. So um, it's kind of fun for me. But I have heard that some people are just utterly utterly upset about Teen Titans Go because yeah, well, th- I mean, they had more. Um more serious cartoons like Young Justice, Beware the Batman, uh, they had a Green Lantern, like, CGI one, mm-hmm. and I know a lot of people like those, and those got canceled after, like, se- some of them after a season or two. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's a problem sometimes with, with these cartoons, because they do have that, that same problem you have with comic books, where you have, you know, you want to tell these deep, dark stories, but at the end of the day, you know, your demographic is younger. You know, you, the demographic for, it's, at least in the U.S., because I'm sure we'll get cards. Well, hey, let's get some cards from that is coming from angry people. But, um, you know, at least in the U.S., you know, cartoons are seen as, as a children's uh, genre. And, you know, I don't know of anyone who picks up their first comic at 22 and say, ah, yes, this is what I'm going to read. No, you start reading them when you're a little kid. And you like the fancy colors and the flashes and the booms and the big, easy-to-read words. And, you know, and there's the deepness in the stories even then. Um, but, you know, I think it's sort of like when you um, go back and, and, and you uh, watch Looney Tunes and now you get a lot of the jokes. And you convince yourself that when you were four, you got all those jokes. But mm-hmm. you just like seeing the Wile E. Coyote fall down. You know, it's you didn't get the... You didn't get all the subtle humor then that, that you like to think you get, but um, you know. like Bugs Bunny in a dress, yeah. Yes, you know, oh, man, that that led to a lot of confused kids. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I think I think I I don't know if they I heard somewhere that I thought that I had heard that the comic book industry in general there that the uh, audience wasn't they weren't drawing in as many young people as they used to. So, like, the demographic was aging up just because not too many newer, younger fans were coming in. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting that's an interesting take. Because um, I had heard, just to uh, go through random things we've heard, um, mm. that basically one of, the, one of the reasons why they pull off sliding time is that um, most, co- that the majority of their comic readers don't read comic books their whole lives. Um, and so, basically... You know, you start when you're like, you know, between eight and 13 years old. You read till you're like 18 to 20 years old. And then, you know, you start, you know, doing other things with your life. And you still maybe have a love for it, but maybe you only see the movies or you'll watch the TV show. Um, but you don't like, you're not a weekly buyer or monthly buyer anymore. Um, but of course, that probably has been changing. And that's why books are getting more expensive because as you cater to an older, demographic you need to pay the writers more because you need to maintain that level of writing uh to keep your volume up but at the end of the day you know as they as 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 they say you know uh, guardians of the galaxy made its money back before its first ticket was sold just on uh t-shirt sales you know uh, it's it's and you know you know I'll, it, uh, I'll actually say this they don't they don't make rocket raccoon t-shirts in my size um <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fat guy, and, and man, I, every time I go to the website, it's like, oh, get your favorite geek clothing. It's like, oh, it only goes up to 3X. Uh, uh, you know, so it's it's very disheartening yeah. to. Well, I'm see, fat by nerds. The, that's the. <laughs> I think the problem with the comic book industry is like, they don't have the advertising. Like, you know, the movies do so successful because they, you know, you have the commercials on TV and. I mean, you'll see advertising everywhere, but with the comic books, unless you go looking for them, 
like anyone, mm-hmm. someone on the outside who really doesn't collect, unless you go looking for them, you're not really going to see a lot of advertisement for. Yeah, well, no, I mean the actual books. That is the thing. It's only when you have a world event like uh, Death of Captain America, Black Captain America, Girl Thor, or Woman Thor. <laughs> you know, uh, it's only when these that uh, all the media says, "Hey, guess what's happening in comic books," and then you get that publicity. Um, and if you don't do that, which explains why you get all these books, because that's the only way that you get people to say, hey, look over here, um, mm-hmm. is you put on a big event that's going to change the status quo for, you know, a, a, a time. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's the difficulty of the comic book industry, I would, I would assume, because it is such a cloistered group, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to break out of the demographics and, you know, um, you know, it, it, especially because, you know, I think one of your hardest things with comic books is that it's not like you're selling a novel. Uh, you know, you're asking someone to come in, make a, you know, three to five dollar commitment every month to this to this book. And you're only going to get in your first book, you know, at most, you know, uh, 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 one tenth or one twelfth of the story, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. that serialization, it's, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to sell in this world of binge watching, you know, um, which, which opens that question. I wonder if someday with digital comics, you might get to the idea of binge reading. Uh, so you'll be able to get the full 12 run of, you know, the secret wars in digital on your iPhone. You can just read them all today. Or you can space them out, you know, and, you know, because they're always looking for new revenue. There's Lego Marvel. That's your next revenue stream. You you yeah. you will be binge reading uh, on your on your on your mobile device uh, the next series. Um, you get the I, I yeah. Well, I think that's the graphic novel. Uh, you know, the graphic novel is Netflix. You know, if you wait if you wait till the show is actually out, then you get the graphic novel and get all twelve parts at once. Well, yes, it's um, but of course with Netflix you have your, the new shows, so you can get all of oranges. So when Orange is the New Black comes out, mm. you get the whole season. You don't just get yeah. One episode. Yeah, I was thinking more like network TV. Like, yeah. you know, you don't you didn't get you know every episode of Breaking Bad. You know, but if you waited till the end of the season, you could go buy the DVD. Yeah, or even to just get it a whole, the whole season on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, or get it on Netflix. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting as they adapt. It's interesting just the idea that comic books have stuck around this long. Really, when you think about it, um, you know. Because they have been around, as as they'll tell us, more than 75 years, probably approaching 100 years now, um, since Superman first put on his tights, and uh, that's that's pretty impressive as 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 a media in this in this age, you know, that it oh, yeah. that it's continued on and remained relatively unchanged in storytelling and uh, presentation. It's still panels and word bubbles, um, although you don't get a lot of thought balloons anymore. That's that. I no, guess, you don't. No, that's that's the that's the um, that's the casualty of uh, of a modern cynicism. Is we don't thought balloons anymore. And Sometimes you, know, you get like a, get a caption box, but yeah, no yes, thought bubble. Yes, I miss thought bubbles. Though they did look <laughs> silly, you know. Yeah. Although you can still tell when someone's a robot because their 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 words are in a box with a lightning bolt, as opposed to just a bubble. With that's how you can tell an organic person from an inorganic person in comic books. Is, how the yeah. word bubble is drawn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I think over just about everything. Um, a little bit of the uh, official topic of Axis and then on into uh, the um, psychosomatic nature of superheroic powers uh, and finishing up with a little bit of shop talk about the industry and it all connected. Um, so I want to thank uh, my co-host this week, Powerful, powerful Phil Perch <laughs> and uh, I of course am I believe I was the Cherubic Charlie Esser and this has been Super Connectivity for this week uh, come on back next week and we'll connect some more stuff have a great day <laughs> <laughs>